Dr. Warner, um, thank you so much for coming and joining us online to do this presentation. Um, he was going to be giving this talk in the office a couple of weeks ago, um, and so we have uh, transitioned over to the online platform to be able to do this. Um, Peter has done work for Sonoma Land Trust uh, for a number of years doing botanical surveys on our land. Um, and I'm going to just uh, read his bio here real quick. Um, so Peter Warner has been involved in the study of plants and ecology for about 40 years, coinciding with his westward migration from East Coast roots. While some evidence exists for his earlier interest in plant life, the fossil record is incomplete. During his pre-Cambrian era, working in urban forestry and landscaping in the Bay Area, he became absorbed in the study of wild plants in California and the American West, and eventually earned a BS and then an MA in biology, ecology, from Sonoma State University. Over the past 25 years, he's taught several botanically oriented classes and workshops, and organized hundreds of trips throughout California and beyond to explore ecological diversity. During this time, he has been active in a number of environmental organizations, primarily focused on learning and teaching about the critical importance of intact ecosystems and ecological processes to the long-term health of all the living. Since moving on from about 10 years working in national and state parks, Peter has provided botanical and ecological consulting services to several conservation organizations, public agencies, and private land managers. He continues to offer somewhat sporadically workshops and classes and reveals revels in spontaneous opportunities to share wonder and musings about life's rich pageant. For relief from more mundane he spent several days a week contemplating nature on his own or in the company of other naturalists and thinkers. He has discovered that nature provides no dearth of material from which, which to harvest enlightenment. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Peter. Thank you, Ingrid. And uh, thank you all very much for joining me here. And uh, I think picking up with, I kind of forgotten that I'd even written that biography some time ago, but uh, I don't see any reason to alter my pathway tonight. So I'm happy to be here. And I'll start right in with uh, what's the explanation behind this opening slide? Well, you know, I was looking for a bit of inspiration. For whatever reason, the, uh, the Greek folklore about the phoenix came to mind. And I started looking up online and I found this photograph of purportedly the phoenix nebula. And the phoenix for those of you who aren't familiar with the uh, mythology, supposedly a long-lived bird that uh, dies, it, either through sun-induced combustion or just decomposition, then is magically reborn again, regenerating. So the phoenix symbolizes renewal, rebirth, regeneration. And thus my reference here to this mythological creature I thought was appropriate for discussing post-fire effects on plants and vegetation. Now in the course of doing this, I actually incidentally found out that there, I don't believe there actually is a Phoenix Nebula. I, I found several pop references and even photos labeled as a Phoenix Nebula, but other than a relatively minor Southern uh, Hemisphere constellation, I found no, uh, you know, cataloging of an official uh, Phoenix Nebula. So moving on from that, um, First thing I'd like to do before I get started on the uh, body of this work is to just acknowledge uh, some people and organizations and specifically Sonoma Land Trust and Pe the Pepperwood Preserve for providing me funding in 2018 to work on their lands to catalog uh, botanical discoveries for those two organizations. A number of friends, mentors, inspirational authors, and other fire ecologists, and in particular, the indigenous and tribal ecological practitioners, caretakers, and fire ecologists that preceded our time here in California. Again, yet a third title for this talk, but I was also looking for something to inspire me, I suppose, and I really thought about the bulk of this and said, what I'm really looking at are a lot of beautiful flowers and the different textures and um, ecological significance of those flowers to the landscape that has changed so much in the last few years in a good portion of Sonoma County. So the impetus for this talk originally stemmed from uh, being hired by the Land Trust as well as Pepperwood 
to conduct surveys in 2018. In particular, for the Sonoma Land Trust uh, in 2018, I was hired to return to four properties, um, four of the eight uh, at which I had conducted vegetation mapping in the year 2013. In my return in 2018, the uh, primary um, the focus was to be to document all the vascular plants that I could, and in particular, note how the flora of each of those properties had shifted or changed since my initial surveys in 2013. Uh, some of the extenuating factors um, in 2018 and 2013, first of all, 2013 was an extremely dry year. And my primary activity that year was not to focus on botanical documentation of all the species. It was primarily on a broader task involving mapping vegetation types on those properties. And so my focus was somewhat different in 2013. And then last but not least, 2018, a landscape that had been markedly difficult to access in 2013 was suddenly wide open. So my access was much improved, enable, enabling me uh, to get to a much um, larger proportion of each of those properties. So just briefly, the results, I'm not going to read out all those numbers, but remarkable increases that I noted in 2018 and 2019 combined on those four land trust properties. Uh, Glen Oaks, uh, Secret Pasture, Stewart Creek Hill are all more or less in uh, southeastern Sonoma County, um, in near Sonoma Valley or up into the Myakamas Mountains. Live Oaks is up near Knights Valley in northeastern Sonoma County, but all cases showed a dramatic increase in the number of plant taxa that I observed in 2018 and 19 compared to 2013. So I'm going to, in, during this talk tonight, the first thing I want to do is provide you some kind of a foundation for fire, the mechanical, um, the chemical, and the, uh, so the physical mechanical or uh, chemical, and as well as the ecological functions that fire serves in terms of uh, being an ecosystem process um, in much of California. So substrates are actually quite telling and, for, and uh, factorial in terms of uh, some of the plant discoveries and observations I made. And I would say that uh, most notably, most of the more interesting flora that I found were located on out outcrops of andesite and basalt, um, as well as, uh, in particular, rhyolite throughout the uh, Myakamas Mountains and at Live Oaks. Vegetation, fairly similar at most of the properties, oak woodlands, some grassland, and at Glen Oaks, secret pasture, and um, also at Live Oaks, uh, a fair amount of uh, Knobcone pine woodland or forest. So there's a lot in common, but we'll see how much there was in common in terms of the actual plants shortly. So just quickly going through this, I don't want to spend a lot of time on these details. It's not really the point of this uh, talk, but again, some foundation. What is combustion? It's an oxidative process combining materials that have hydrocarbons with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide, water, and energy. Um, fire is essentially an oxidative chain reaction that occurs at high temperature. As such, it's essentially the reverse of photosynthesis, which as we know, of course, incorporates a carbon dioxide and water with the input of energy to produce carbohydrates for plants. Um, in order for fire to sustain itself, fuel, heat, and oxygen must all be available in su sufficient quantities. That is known as the fire triangle. Heat is a major factor and can be quite a constraining factor in sustaining fire depending on the amount of water available whether it's in the soil or in the existing fuel and so forth because heat to sustain itself and fire to sustain itself heat must be able to overcome the vaporization of water so the fuels need to be sufficiently dried out to in order to carry the heat uh, necessary to sustain a fire heat transfer in fire is primarily through conduction convection, radiation, and fuels ultimately provide the heat source. Again, they need to be relatively dry. And that's, of course, influenced by a number of factors, such as fuel type and coarseness, different vegetation layers, and so forth. And atmospheric conditions, including low humidity, wind, and at a larger scale, unstable air masses are all influential in sustaining or um, ignition of fires. <clears throat> 
The effects of fire on soil structure and chemistry are extremely variable, numerous, and complex. I've kind of highlighted some of the ones that I thought are most important. Again, these all have a bearing on what we're going to see in terms of uh, plant responses later on in the presentation. So soil heating, it's again very variable. It depends on the intensity of the fire itself. I didn't define what intensity is, but if I think we all have kind of an innate sense of what a more intense fire is versus a less intense fire. And also not just the intensity, but the duration. I will say that intensity often does incorporate the actual temperature of a given fire or fire front. The duration though is also important. So if a fire, for instance, if you burn a brush pile on a flat surface, the soil beneath is probably going to uh, become a lot hotter at a deeper level because the fire is sustained in that one spot for a longer period of time than if it were a small brush pile or just a passing fire over that um, patch of ground. The topography, weather, soil, moisture content are also all factors in soil heating. Uh, slope is uh, especially important in terms of its uh, effect on fire intensity and thus on uh, soil heating. Litter and duff cover, how dense is it? What are the fuels actually comprised of? Uh, what is the amount of moisture in those layers on the surface of the soil uh, before the fire starts? Uh, soil texture and structure are not only affected by fire, but uh, fire intensity can actually increase the coarseness of, of the soil. Uh, other factors such as the bulk density, porosity, pore size, and distribution in the soil, these are all factors that are important in terms of the movement of nutrients as well as water in the soil. Soil color actually changes. Why is that important? Because soil of different colors has a different amount of surface albedo and hence has a different effect on the temperature of the soils and thus on the microorganisms and other soil characteristics. Soil water repellency or hydrophobicity is also affected uh, and why that's important is because it does uh, essentially affect water infiltration into the soil. And the last but certainly not least and I'll develop a little more detail um, about this next slide. Soil chemistry is affected through nutrient relations. Oxidation, the process of fire, typically increases mineral mobility uh, as a result of the breakdown of plant materials. It also uh, essentially affects alterations in soil, microflora and fauna, and um, through that as well, nutrient volatilization or nutrient capture by those microorganisms in the soil. Combustion typically, again, releases nutrients essential for plant growth. However, large proportions of nutrients are actually lost in the process of fire burning as well as thereafter through wind, runoff leaching, volatilization. So effects on nutrients. M many of us I think maybe have some sense of this that nitrogen, if you've ever gardened in California, typically the nutrient that is most limiting for plant growth in most California soils is nitrogen. And there are a number of reasons for that that I won't go into. However, nitrogen of course is a macronutrient, an essential component of everything in our bodies and everything in just about every living organism or body. So um, it's essential yet often in short supply and that certainly goes for plants as well as for the rest of us. The act actual uh, pyrolysis or the breakdown of those amino acids and enzymes and so forth that contain nitrogen typically involves the volatilization of nitrogen as ammonium or various compounds of nitrogen and nitrous oxides. Nitrogen volatilizes at a much higher rate during hot, hot fires. So more nitrogen is actually lost to the atmosphere uh, or to surrounding soil in some cases um, during a really hot fire. However, some nitrogen is always left behind in ash and soil. So wind actually turns out to be quite a great factor if it's really windy immediately after a fire or in the days following a fire, a great deal additional nitrogen can be lost. Post-fire soils, for the most part, throughout much of California, and uh, as discovered or uh, demonstrated in numerous studies, um, most soils retain enhanced levels of uh, ammonium, the ion ammonium, for up to a year following fires. Uh, nitrogen 
is also available through the process of nitrogen fixation. And that generally in most ecosystems occurs primarily through the um, shared symbiosis between uh, bacteria and plant roots. The other way it happens or can happen is through uh, the um, division of the uh, atmospheric nitrogen molecules by lightning. Free living soil bacteria and plant symbiotic bacteria um, are those organisms that are associated with plant roots and we'll see a lot of the plants that form those symbioses with those soil bacteria. Some of those species and some are either symbiotic or not and others are specifically free living or symbiotic. So it kind of runs the gamut. Um, these organisms typically readily colonize post fire soils and as we'll see the plants do their part as well. Uh, phosphorus, another important uh, macronutrient, is generally completely volatilized or certainly to a large degree is because it typically is volatilized at relatively low temperatures. However, a lot of it can be translocated deeper into soils, which will have a beneficial effect for later plant growth. And the loss of organic soil content, again, uh, an influence on that is certainly fire intensity and, and how long the residual effects of fire heat the soil. Um, because as, as organic matter is lost, the cation exchange capacity, those holding places for those nutrient ions in the soil are lost. So greater heat often typically means reduced cation exchange capacity and probably a longer transitional time before some of those uh, macronutrients and minor nutrients as well can be recaptured in the ecosystem. Okay, here's a uh, diagram. Many of you may remember this from high school or college biology. Um, I don't know, um, can you all see my cursor on screen? I don't know, but I'm gonna use it. Um, where does fire come in? And I'll show you another diagram similar to this one. Essentially where fire would come in is in this area here, kind of a replacement for the more slow, typical decomposition processes that happen on the surface of the soil in ecosystems. So what you do is you get a rapid transition kind of through these two stages into the ammonium ion. And as well, as I mentioned earlier, nitrogen fixation from some of the uh, um, co-symbionts with plants that exist in the soil or are captured by uh, plant roots. So that's that, and I'm gonna move on from there. Uh, another uh, diagram, I apologize, the quality's not so great. I kind of looked at this, and of course they do uh, show fire occurring over here. I thought there might perhaps be a few more arrows that actually show some of the transitional processes between the actual combustion of uh, plant material and the conversion into ammonium way over here. It does show fixation, nitrification, which is conversion of ammonium ions into nitrate ions, <clears throat> which are primarily the formulation in which nitrogen is taken up by plant roots. So again, I'm not gonna go into mo any more detail on that. It's just important to realize that there's a great deal of nutrient turnover as a result of the combustion of organic materials during wildfires. So getting a little bit more into the ecology, uh, something I'm perhaps a little better versed in. Uh, fire has been evolutionarily and ecologically integral component of California's vegetation uh, and its flora for many millions of years. Certainly uncertain, but I think it's pretty safe to say for probably tens of millions to even hundreds of millions of years that uh, fire has been part of the landscape throughout the world um, and certainly in California. Um, it has a wide array of effects on all level of plant organization from cells to ind individual uh, plants all the way up into entire communities of plants, the landscape, and ecosystems. Generally speaking, again, it's, all these things are generalizations and certainly in biology it's rife with exceptions to rules. However, plant species gen uh, diversity generally increases a great deal following fires uh, through changes in ambient environmental conditions such as the reduction in shade and forests that are lost to fire. Um, competitive responses uh, among the species that remain behind, uh, the increased availability of resources and many other uh, factors including those that um, are inherent in the plants themselves. And I won't necessarily read all those but uh, some of those factors involve 
uh, plant morphology and how the plants themselves um, have evolved to um, evolve structures that actually enable them to withstand or persist following a fire. Uh, the physiology itself uh, is also affected certainly through plant chemicals and processes that regulate growth and so forth in plants. And another factor is the life history of plants, how long they live, uh, their reproductive stages, what times of year they flower and so forth. These are all factors uh, or envir you know, environmental conditions or plant conditions that uh, are influenced by fire. I think it's important to note that plants through long evolutionary histories have evolved these responses to fires. A single plant or plant species is not necessarily evolved to fire. Those plant species for the most part typically evolved or have responded to fire regimes. And in general, that was part of what I referred to at the outset down in the lower uh, left-hand corner about the uh, accumulated ancestral wisdom. It's not necessarily just applicable towards human beings, but actually to all the organisms in terms of their relationship uh, to fire and ecology in general. So what happens with fire regimes and what can happen is really what's more, most critical in terms of fire regimes is that a dramatic shift in fire regimes, which includes how often fires occur, what are their intensity, what is their pattern on the landscape, can reduce plant diversity and also result in long-term and even irreversible changes in the composition of plant communities. This is, I think, of vital importance in California for those of us who are concerned with retention of the native flora and ecosystem functions throughout a great deal of California. And I would say in particular in those areas uh, that are characterized now by a very active uh, urban interface with wildlands in California. And a quote I ran across uh, in one of my reference texts, pyrodiversity creates biodiversity. And I thought about that. And I would say that this, or does pyrodiversity sustain biodiversity? And I would say there's probably some of both. I'm gonna move now into just a really brief history. This is probably even more uh, superficial than the uh, discussing some of the effects of fire. Um, Fire probably predates our existence as a species itself. Uh, there is some evidence going back, I believe, uh, 400,000 or more years ago. Um, I believe I read somewhere two, over 2 million years ago. In any event, pre-Homo sapiens, there is evidence that uh, those animals were using fire to help trap animals and even perhaps to manage vegetation. Fire has been an elemental part of the uh, evolution of humans, both biologically and culturally, in terms of language and agriculture and communication. Um, essentially, human behavioral responses, including and specifically land stewardship, have probably augmented natural fire regimes for several millennia. Um, ancestral indigenous fire management practices remain common in some cultures today and probably date in California back to over 11,000 years ago. At the peak of the population of the indigenous cultures in California, uh, somewhere estimated between six to 13 million acres of California probably burned annually. Most of those fires were at lower to mid elevations uh, in the Sierra Nevada and other mountain ranges. The high Sierra desert areas, uh, probably the very immediate coast, essentially the shoreline, were areas that were for the most part uh, because vegetation typically didn't allow the carrying of fire, were not uh, systematically burned by the indigenous cultures in California. The importance of fire to those indigenous cultures really can't be overemphasized. And I uh, really owe it to uh, the authors of the Fire in California Ecosystems, and in particular, a contributing author and author of her own book, Living in the Wild, I believe is what it's called, uh, by uh, M. Cat Anderson, um, that really went over and emphasized the importance of fire as a management tool for indigenous cultures in California. It was an economic health and safety necessity. Of utmost importance was the development of what is now known as a fire-making kit, 
and I'll show you some photographs and examples of the, uh, uh, that management tool. Uh, care and enhancement of food and all the basketry, cordage plants, and other uh, plants that were essential to the myriad cultures that were extant in California for thousands of years prior to European American um, uh, arrival in California. Uh, the indigenous cultures recognize not only the important, importance of protecting resources vital to their communities, but also the importance of protecting those communities as well as uh, their biotic communities uh, that were essential to their living uh, from catastrophic fires. Uh, so probably the earliest developers of uh, a prescribed fire were many of those indigenous cultures. And in the course of the, the process of uh, preventing fires, the reduction of fuel accumulation resulted in the recycling of nutrients, which was probably very early uh, established as uh, beneficial to the regrowth of those plants and actually their individual vitality and uh, accordingly uh, human health. Uh, fire was also important for maintaining wildlife habitat and for the safety and visibility and travel of the indigenous uh, people and as well as their um, opening up hunting areas for um, accessibility both to themselves as well as to wildlife. Uh, it also served a purpose for uh, reducing plant disease and pests on plants that were important to those cultures. And uh, I'm sure it didn't escape anyone's notice that the enhancement of biodiversity occurred during burning or through burning and probably coincides fairly well with the uh, intermediate disturbance hypothesis, which was uh, proposed and articulated by the ecologist Connell uh, some uh, 40 years ago. So as a result of indigenous burning, the pre-European landscape in California was most likely a patchwork pattern of active stewardship through conducted fires and other management activities conducted by indigenous cultures uh, merged with some of the natural processes such as through lightning throughout California um, and especially again at middle to low elevations in California. So in the upper left, a uh, 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 just a photograph of uh, Kat Anderson's book, which I strongly recommend reading. It's a, a wonderful read, heartrending at times, but full of great information. Um, next to the right is a photograph of an indigenous cultural um, a California man using a fire kit, in this case, uh, a relatively slim down one consisting of uh, essentially a spindle-like uh, uh, piece of wood that was spun rapidly back and forth uh, between the palms of the hand and the friction in that hearth board at the base created enough friction and heat. Typically at the base of that, you might also find a small amount of uh, ignitable material such as dried moss, pine needles, and so forth. Next to the right is a photograph, uh, current, relatively, of an indigenous Australian woman igniting uh, the Australian bushland. In the lower left is a, I would say, maybe a little bit more of a modern version of uh, a model of a, a fire kit. So essentially what the uh, um, man at the top is using, this is maybe a little bit more of a sophisticated version. And fire was also started through the use of uh, friction or sudden collision of uh, rocks to create sparks. And uh, one of the, uh, I would imagine that what happens here is that you grasp this stone with one hand and you're hitting it on some kind of another stone that will uh, promote the production of sparks. And, uh, but not having used one, I don't know for sure. I'd love to see one demonstrated. Okay, re more recent history in, uh, of fire history in California. Um, the Spanish mission period uh, be actually began the process of uh, displacement and disease and genocide of indigenous pe people, and more than that, the decimation of their cult cultures and their cultural activities. As a result, one of the things that probably started happening uh, more or less about 200 years ago was a general uh, overall reduction in indigenous burning in California. Uh, later on in the 1800s and into the 1900s and really to the current day, uh, some privately owned ranches and farms and timber harvest operations continue to implement uh, burning 
on their lands to improve forage, clear brush, uh, probably promote timber stock as opposed to brush in timber stands. Um, in addition to the demise of many of the indigenous cultures, uh, concurrently, European Americans introduced livestock, engaged in mining activities, timber harvest, and so forth. These also contributed significantly uh, to the disruption of indigenous burning and the disruption alteration of historical fire regimes. One of the consequences of this was the introduction of a great number of non-native species, uh, the establishment of which also further alters fire regimes. Uh, initially in national parks, which I was unaware of, uh, the US Army was one of the initial managers of some of the early national parks. And then the Forest Service were both at the forefront of early fire suppression campaigns in California. Because of a series of fires uh, throughout North America, especially in the early 1900s, fire suppression uh, gradually but consistently became codified as policy and law into the early 20th century in uh, throughout most of North America, uh, and certainly that included California. It was primarily those these laws and policies were uh, enacted and implemented to protect timber production. However, and even through today, uh, the premises upon which fire management is sometimes conducted is uh, not necessarily ecologically appropriate for some ecosystems in terms of the application of fire and the extent of uh, modification of historical fire regimes it can cause. Uh, more recently, the increases, and certainly we're well aware of this over the last hundred years or so, of the urban interface, the um, rapid population growth of California, as the human population, as well as the uh, introduction of numerous uh, examples of infrastructure, uh, more or less interfaced with uh, ecosystems and wildlands in California. Uh, again, pretty much simultaneously with the increase in urban interface has been, I think, the promotion of this concept of taming the wilderness and the uh, Consequent industrialization of uh, logging and national forests, uh, which incidentally are kind of uh, interesting that some of those scientific advances that were initially, uh, in terms of the study or the development of those uh, technologies, actually turned around to essentially uh, were formative in the science of fire ecology. So uh, I think I'll leave this at that. Um, human communities have certainly complicated the cause for perhaps introducing fire in California. Uh, a couple of websites that you might uh, be interested in visiting that I've listed below. I can return to these later or give you this information privately after this presentation. So I'll move on from there. So now we're into uh, what for me I think will be a little more interesting and exciting. Uh, what I've done here first is try to capture some of the landscape level uh, views of California landscapes uh, over the last three years. Um, several of the early ones here that I took were actually um, ones that I most recently took up in the uh, Geysers region of uh, Sonoma County in the Kincaid fire area from that burned this past fall. These photos were taken mostly in February 2020 or about four months since the fire. And this photograph was taken pretty much right up at the upper end of Pine Flat Road near the entrance to the geysers at the end of that road. More uh, landscapes uh, a ways down Pine Flat Road in the area of, uh, I believe, Schoolhouse Flat in the Mayakamas Modini Preserve along Pine Flat Road. And uh, it's pretty dramatic when you see uh, the photos I'll show you later on from some of the other fires in Sonoma County from 2017 uh, is the utter devastation and complete combustion of almost all the available fuels in the Kincaid fire. In particular, this is striking to me because I was working in the area and visited the area um, along a Pine Flat Road following the 2004 Geysers fire. That fire burned with a great deal less intensity uh, along in that area. And indeed, many of the trees hardly looked touched following that fire, although it was a fairly intense fire in some areas. The area around Schoolhouse Flat um, did burn, especially upslope and along the road there. For instance, the, the small um, cabin 
that exists or existed at Pine Flat was barely touched in uh, 2004, but completely destroyed last fall. So the barren soil, a lot of that, of course, right now is a result of a very dry winter. And it'll be interesting to see how uh, the recent rains and hopefully wet winters in the future actually influence the recovery of vegetation from the Kincaid fire. Moving into more uh, not quite so recent fires, most of the rest of the photos are going to be from either the Nuns fire for the most part and a few perhaps from uh, the Tubbs fire in eastern Sonoma County, in, uh, that both of which occurred in October 2017. Uh, I'm not going to probably provide you a lot of details. One thing I want to note though in several of these photos, especially those taken in Chaparral, is the fairly extensive cover of non-native annual grasses. Uh, I did briefly allude to that, that the uh, alterations uh, in fire regime or the introduction of non-native species, uh, they essentially a feedback loop as uh, more and more uh, flashy fuels like non-native grasses are introduced into ecosystems that can have uh, a great deal of impact on the ignitability of those ecosystems in terms of starting new fires and through that uh, a greater fire frequency, uh, perhaps fires of a different type of uh, burn pattern or intensity can drastically alter fire regimes over a period of time. So it's something to kind of keep an eye on some of these ecosystems if we actually, um, of course, a lot of us probably won't be here to necessarily look at fire regimes, which really you can't uh, properly assess um, other than over centuries. But nonetheless, it'll be interesting to see if those uh, annual grass and other annual plant fuels will alter fire regimes in the near future. And that's evident here again at the two top photos, which these are all taken, I believe, at Glen Oaks Ranch in Sonoma Valley. The uh, fairly high cover of annual grasses, even with the uh, reemergent shrub layer and tree layers um, in that area. Uh, contrast that with the view in Knobcone Pine Woodland, whereas the Knobcone Pines themselves pretty much um, are gone. They, none, none of those uh, snags will re-sprout. I'll get to that later. Uh, but the uh, most of the uh, broadleaf plants, flowering plants, shrubs, trees are re vigorously in the Knobcone Pine Forest. Another view, this is looking from, uh, for those of you familiar with Glen Oaks, this is looking from the Manzanita Loop Trail. Oh, essentially, I think to the south or southeast um, with Stewart Creek Canyon kind of uh, diagonally bisecting the photograph, that kind of dark strip of vegetation. And then looking beyond that into the Bouvery Preserve and beyond that, I believe into uh, probably uh, Oak Hill Farm property, uh, upslope from Highway 12, east of Glen Ellen. Further up uh, on Cavedale Road, this is an uh, upslope from Glen Oaks, uh, probably about three miles up Cavedale Road, the upper part of Hooker Creek Canyon. Notice in particular the uh, relative uh, lower intensity of the fire down in the canyon slopes and particularly at the bottom of the canyon. And uh, from talking uh, with a local resident who stayed behind during uh, the nun's fire at his home, uh, the Activity of the fire, the movement of the fire through that area was amazingly fast. And I would imagine the fire was actually probably carried over some of the canyons, however, burning very hot on adjacent slopes. Also on Manzanita Loop Trail, this is a view from the trail looking north, Hood Mountains kind of behind some of those uh, Knopcone Pine snags to the left and Sugarloaf Ridge off to the right. And uh, just starting to give you a little bit of a sampling of some of the color floristic changes uh, in these landscapes over the last two or three years. Another view from Manzanita Loop Trail at Glen Oaks. What's all that white stuff? Well, I'll get to that. <laughs> More of the same. Some of the Knobcone Pines. Uh, this would be about 18, 19 months after the fire itself. Uh, probably in part due to uh, a lot of soil saturation in some of the places uh, with the very heavy rains that were sustained uh, both in spring of 2018 and uh, March, April of 2019, uh, but already starting to topple due to uh, probably the common effects of soil moisture as well as wind. And that'll increase, of course, over time. More and more of those snags will come down and 
be laying down more fuel for the next time that uh, forest is ready to burn. Finally, a view from up near the Napa and Sonoma County line, uh, kind of on the southwest slopes of Mount Beater near Bismarck Knob, Bismarck Knob, and uh, just another example of uh, recovery in this case of a chaparral stand adjacent to a stand of Knobcone Pine Forest. And this is from the secret pasture property, uh, kind of in the southeast part of that parcel. And uh, notable here, the skeletons are primarily uh, shrubs, notably, most notably, I believe in this case, from the shrub chemise. And you can see some of that re-sprouting to the lower right. Um, and uh, a lot of annual grasses again. In the background, probably a single Douglas fir at the top of that rocky knoll. Um, you can't really see it so well from here. There's a change in soil type between the area that's predominantly chemise and that which uh, is actually uh, supporting a higher cover of tree species, such as knobcone pine and Douglas fir and California bay. So, um, and what I noticed in just moving through that, even in the shrub community, that there were different shrub components of that particular vegetation type. So a little bit of a change there, I believe, from rhyolite into a more basalt-based uh, geology. So moving in a little bit closer, starting to look at the uh, very diverse understory following the fires, uh, in this case, again, the Nuns Fire, and its effect on the herbaceous layer in, at, um, at Glen Oaks Ranch. This is, uh, all these photographs are either in Napcon Pine Woodland or kind of a combinant chaparral type dominated by various manzanitas and chemise, to some extent, toyon and other shrubs. So what about other ecosystems? Uh, unfortunately, I did not have a great deal of time uh, in, last year to spend at Live Oaks Ranch. I did get out there uh, for a day and it was glorious. Uh, the substrates there are quite a bit different. Uh, Live Oak supports a proportionally compared to Glen Oaks or Secret Pasture. Uh, extensive grasslands, uh, most of the grasslands there uh, are actually a fairly good mixture of native and non-native species and thinner soils there really, I believe, uh, reduce uh, competition from annual grasses and forbs with some of our native forbs. And, uh, the next few slides are gonna show you examples of just how beautifully colorful it was uh, at Live Oaks Ranch last year. A lot of exposures, uh, again, close to the surface. Uh, this is, I believe, mostly basaltic grassland. So outcroppings of basalt. And again, very thin soils. Uh, there are, I see plenty of non-native grasses and forbs in this photograph, but they're, getting along more or less compatibly with the native forbs, uh, which is quite unlike typically valley bottom soils in Sonoma County, which for the most part have been uh, completely dominated now by non-native uh, annual and perennial grasses. Another view of the grasslands at uh, Live Oaks Ranch. So what are all those colorful critters? Essentially the ones that we saw the most of, purple owls, clover, sky lupin, blue dicks, and common popcorn flower. So individual plant species response. This is the only bryophyte or moss that I found to be notable in the immediate post-fire environment. Uh, it, not, it didn't just, uh, not only was I able to note, it was so dominant in so many areas post-fire and so colorful uh, a number of other ecologists noted this. Turns out Funaria hygrometrica is also uh, trying to recall the common name. Bonfire moss is one. And interestingly enough, just today I discovered that this moss has some potential as a bioremediation agent in that uh, various tissues in the protonema of this moss can sequester water, uh, water, lead in water solutions. So it has some potential as a decontaminant for water supplies that are tainted with lead. An interesting side note about Funaria. And uh, you may have seen other, many other photos. Uh, these photos don't do it justice. In some cases, it was a brilliant flaming red-orange, almost like fire were revisiting the landscape. So the primary organization of the rest of this talk is going to be around what are some of the individual uh, strategies, if you will, of plants to help them 
enable them to respond to fire. And not necessarily individual plants may die. That's certainly true of the annual plants and even some perennials that are obligate reseeding germinants following fire. But plants have all sorts of strategies and I'm gonna kind of go through those, more or less organizing them around various themes. So the first group, uh, probably the one that a lot of us certainly are more familiar with is uh, uh, the capacity of most hardwood plants to crown sprout. And crown sprouting is essentially the uh, hormonal driven response of plants that activates uh, areas of latent buds uh, either at the soil surface or just beneath the soil surface at the base of the stems of woody plants. And uh, there, uh, typically what happens is that plant growth is driven by hormonal responses activated in the growing tips of the plant. Well, when those are burned, they lose their influence and the active buds or the buds at the base of the plants become active and resume the growth in order to uh, maintain photosynthetic um, Produ production in those plants, enable those plants to survive following fire. And certainly California Bay is one of the more notable and uh, obvious plants that does this. Uh, Coast Redwood, though a conifer, is one of the few conifers that actually uh, exhibits this type of epicormic uh, budding. Uh, redwoods are partially protected by their bark it's interesting to note, you'll see at the tops of the trees um, in both photographs, that a lot of the smaller branches uh, are permanently damaged most likely from fire, but the main stems, those epicormic buds were shielded by thick bark. Tannin may also be a factor in terms of rendering the bark less flammable in redwood trees. And this essentially protects those uh, epicormic buds and they're activated following fire and redwoods, again, they're probably the only conifer that exhibits this type of behavior in California. I actually heard that mortality is, or read that mortality in giant sequoia tends to be quite high in relatively, uh, even sometimes relatively cool fires. I don't actually know if they also exhibit this type of epicormic sprouting um, along the uh, primary axis and some of the branches of uh, those trees. Big leaf maple and its close relative in the soapberry family buckeye. I actually witnessed both or saw both uh, seedling germination as well as stump sprouting from both of these species. Uh, in particular, um, I probably saw more of it in big leaf maple, uh, but saw lots of examples. And I'll get, I have my own pet term for plants that uh, actually reseed as well as uh, uh, revegetate through survival of pre-existing plants through stump sprouting. Uh, Cal uh, Pacific Madrone is another uh, great example of stump sprouting in California hardwoods. Uh, many land trust properties, including uh, live oaks, as well as uh, a preserve out in the uh, western part of the county, uh, uh, Little Black Mountain, have extensive stands, almost monocultures of Pacific, Pacific Madrone, which I think are likely clonal populations that are survivors from prior fires. And some of those stands are almost pure madrone with very few other uh, uh, woody species within those stands. Manzanitas, uh, interestingly, some manzanitas are obligate cedars following fire, and others, a smaller group or less populated group, are not necessarily uh, only crown sprouters, but they do exhibit the capacity for crown sprouting similar to their relative uh, madrone. And in this photograph, we have an obligate cedar, common or woodland manzanita on the left, seedlings emerging from the ashes, and on the right, a crown sprouting uh, Arctostaphylus glandulosa, uh, maybe Eastwood manzanita or Cushing manzanita, both subspecies are common in, uh, California, in uh, Sonoma County. Close up of two Arctostaphylus uh, resprouts. Uh, there might be the two different subspecies here, not necessarily important, and the necessary characteristics to distinguish between those subspecies are lacking because you really need to look at the presence or absence of glandular hairs in the inflorescence. And of course, on these new resprouts, no flowers yet. So we'll have to just wait.
Jamise, a well-known stump sprouter. Uh, but interestingly enough, so stump sprouting is quite common. I, we've already seen a lot of slides with resprouting uh, chemise plants. Uh, and believe me, they are the devil to get through. I, uh, walking through, especially in 2018, through stands of burned chemise snags, those sticks are stiff as steel, constantly rubbing up against your clothes, snagging your clothes. And uh, I typically came home looking like I myself had been through a fire. Interestingly enough, so chemise actually hedges its bet. It's a bet hedger, and it also reproduces voluminously through seedling germination, seed germination. Uh, an interesting uh, element of that is that the leaf morphology in chemise seedlings is distinctive from the mature leaves on mature plants. And Greg Genevers, uh, who worked at Pepperwood uh, for a long time, as the steward and manager there, and uh, returned as a consultant two years ago to work at Pepperwood to document their changes in fire flora. Uh, kind of noted this to me, that this is more or less this lobing that I tried to show you in the upper right photograph, not a very high quality photograph, but a lot of the young leaves on the seedlings exhibit this lobing character that is typically absent in mature chemise leaves. So that is actually an ancestral leaf form in the rose family. And if you know the uh, shrubs, antelope, bitter brush from the Great Basin, they still retain in mature plants that kind of uh, trifurcated leaf tip and lobing that uh, young chemise plants show here. Another plant that really hedges this bet is uh, Yerba Santa. Uh, I saw lots and lots of seedlings and to probably a fair number less, but many uh, stump sprouting shrubs of Yerba Santa. Um, three of the more common chaparral shrubs that most of us or a lot of us are familiar with. Upper left, coffee berry, lower left, Fremont silk tassel, and upper right is toyon. And again, all of these regenerating from epicormic buds at the base of stems. Uh, interestingly, certainly fire has a uh, direct influence uh, on individual species in terms of exactly where their epicormic buds at the base of stems are located. If they're more exposed at the soil surface, uh, of course, a lower intensity fire may actually uh, reduce the amount of crown sprouting just from damage to those epicormic buds, where if they're actually buried even a short distance into the soil, uh, those epicormic buds uh, withstand a greater amount of heat. Uh, in fires, so greater likelihood that they would um, be able to resprout following fire. So the actual placement even of epicormic buds can be critical in terms of the amount of recovery from uh, resprouting in some species. The oaks, uh, primarily what I witnessed was resprouting in scrub oak and coast live oak. Interestingly enough, uh, I saw in a lot of places where fire was of relatively low intensity, not just basal sprouting in coast live oak, but sprouting throughout the uh, sprouting throughout the uh, canopy of trees, where I assumed that the intensity of the fire beneath those trees or in that area was relatively low. So that was kind of an interesting uh, observation I made, and uh, I did see some trees that were virtually killed outright with a very little bit of a uh, crown sprouting, and others that had almost a full canopy even after burning in that area. Uh, another. Uh, observation, especially in 2018, in uh, a lot of the resprouts on coast live oak, uh, really dense occurrences of uh, pottery mildew. I don't know what species, and I actually got a lot of questions about that. Was that going to kill the trees? I would imagine, I don't know for certain, that that is a condition that these organisms uh, in terms of their populations and their evolved characteristics, I probably contended with for uh, many, many millennia, and that is something that a lot of those plants will shrug, uh, shrug off. Um, another thing to note is that if you're looking at a stand of uh, resprouts at the base of an oak, as in the lower photograph, the vast majority of those will not survive more than a few years. There'll be kind of a competitive selection process within the plant itself, and only a few of those will probably be retained as, the event, as foundational to the eventual recovery structure of the uh, mature tree. Mm -hmm. 
And probably one of the most pleasant surprises, I know Greg and Evers remarked about this, and I was certainly surprised, even though I, I have seen a fair amount of ground rows uh, in especially scrubby areas in Navajo and Pine Woodlands and Eastern Sonoma County in particular, but also in some places in the Western Sonoma County area. Um, ground rows, relatively very low growing rows and uh, just prolific flowering. I don't think I'd ever really seen it flower before. I really can't recall having seen it in flower. So it's likely that um, the first year or two, it did flower both last year as well as the you know, first year after the fires, but I had never seen such just the ground in some places was just bathed in these beautiful pink flowers and quite a stunning display of uh, floral recovery. Uh, I believe uh, ground rows probably come back from mostly rhizomes just below the soil surface. Don't know that for a fact. It may actually have some kind of woody structures. Uh, rhizomes are actually stem uh, tissues that are under the soil. So similar to stems, but they're just buried in soil. Woodrows also made a good recovery in many uh, locations. Uh, I guess I'm a little more uh, jaded about seeing a lot of that. It's certainly beautiful in its own right. Um, and it did make a good recovery in many of the areas that burned as well. Uh, it wasn't quite so prolific, I would say, especially in 2018 as the ground rose was. But quite delightful. Uh, this is a California rank, rare plant rank 1B species. Uh, the plant on the left is the only specimen that I've observed at Glen Oaks Ranch. I believe there's a probably part of the same meta population, at least uh, nearby at uh, Bouverie Preserve. This is a uh, Napa Falls Indigo. This is just off the uh, main trail on the property at Glen Oaks Ranch on the north side of Stewart Creek. In a, uh, as you can see, a lot of Italian thistle, annual grasses, and uh, uh, I won't say whom, but uh, this was a temporary condition for this uh, struggling plant, plant struggling to come back after fire. But a, uh, one of the uh, land trust staff, at my uh, suggestion, diligently returned shortly thereafter and weeded completely around this reemergent plant. And uh, that was a, a wonderful surprise for me and hopefully for the plant as well. On the right, beautiful racemes. The flowers are really small, but the, they're just absolutely gorgeous. And looking at the foliage, it very uh, much resembles uh, that of uh, locust trees, black locust trees, if you're familiar with that um, non-native tree that's fairly common in Sonoma County, especially at old ranches and homesteads. I'm going to move now into woody plants, but those that are obligate cedars, and the reason it's in quotes is because I don't actually know how many of these other than one in particular. Probably several are obligate cedars following fires in terms of their recovery from fire in terms of their populational base. So plants that are lost will not recover from anything other than seed. Uh, however, in some cases, I've already mentioned some that recover both from seed as well as from resprouting. So um, throughout the world of biology and in particular plants, uh, a lot of plants hedge their bets and have a, a number of uh, characters that enable them to withstand fire or other disturbances to their environment or injuries and so forth. So um, one thing I have learned over time is that we know so very little about the individual or collective ecology of plants unless they've been uh, deemed to be a uh, commodifiable resource. Kind of a sad statement, but that's pretty much true. One of the most dramatic recoveries I saw, this is a plant, peak rush rose, that at Glen Oaks in 2013, I found one tiny individual, somehow, I can't remember, but trying to identify this a day or two later from out of a plastic bag, I think I, I, I took it, I, I think I cut part of it off, I think there was one flower left, I, I took the one that was most beat up, and I managed to somehow recall this genus. It was the genus, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember now, Helianthemum, prior to being cro Crocanthemum. But in any event, I was able to identify it. And I initially, before they started flowering this past year, I was looking at perhaps a, another genus and another family entirely until I saw the first flowers. And then I realized that 
literally these hundreds of thousands to millions of plants just at Glen Oaks, where all peak rush rose. Uh, I would imagine the population is called fairly rapidly. Um, it is a perennial woody plant, sub woody, it's kind of a sub shrub, woody at the base, more herbaceous above. But uh, they are prolific and probably will remain fairly conspicuous in those Knobcone Pine Forest and just in Chaparral as well. Uh, at Live Oaks, as well as at Secret Pasture, those two properties in particular, for at least a few more years. Bush poppy, very similar recovery traits, although in the case of bush poppy, I did see some plants, a fairly small minority, that were stump sprouting from uh, pre-existing plants, uh, fire, pre-fire plants. But uh, the upper right photograph, not very good quality, but the ground, two years ago as well as last year in some cases covered with thousands and thousands of seed seedlings for you know less than an acre just thousands of seedlings again I l expect there will be some culling of plants over time which poppy does tend to kind of fade into the background over a period of time some plants may remain visible and flowering for a while but it'll over time without return fire and uh, on that note I wouldn't I would hope there won't be fire for the, even just for the sake of the plants because I would expect very much that that would be a break from the historical fire regime. So we need to give all these plants some time to actually recover um, and become, re, you know, the potential for reproduction becomes uh, manifest in those plants before there's another fire. So hopefully uh, several more decades. Arctostaphylus manzanita, we saw seedlings of that prior to that, but it is an obligate cedar. Uh, plants that are killed outright by fire uh, only recover by germinating seed. Uh, some individual manzanita plants that survive fire will carry on. Uh, I would imagine most of the tissues that are severely damaged will not recover. But for instance, a single limb on some manzanitas I saw look like they might recover and eventually will fill out somewhat. So those initial plants can survive um, following a relatively low intensity burning in that particular area. Uh, that kind of wiry plant that's uh, here with the manzanitas, that is a, uh, a, a lotus species, acmispan species. Uh, and I'll talk about those in a short while. Uh, very important in ecosystems as a nitrogen fixer, uh, supplementing uh, the atmosphere or the uh, uh, nitrogen left over from the burn itself through the active um, symbiosis between uh, several different plant groups as well as legumes and uh, soil bacteria. Okay, another manzanita, uh, as far as I know, is an obligate cedar. It's uh, canescent, Sonoma canescent or hoary manzanita. Hoary because of the uh, white uh, felt like covering of hairs on both surfaces of the leaves. Uh, on the left-hand photo, uh, there's a little bit of bush poppy on the left, and then kind of adjacent on the base of the uh, manzanita seedling is a ceanothus seedling. In the background, I see toyon. So even in this relatively close-scale, small-scale photograph, quite a bit of diversity. And a third manzanita that is an obligate cedar, Stanford manzanita. Uh, Fairly common in some soils, uh, especially, I think this is probably a good example of rhyolitic visible in the left hand photo. On the right, you actually can compare a Stanford manzanita on the right with uh, the Sonoma canescent or Hori manzanita seedling on the left. And uh, hopefully, I'll be able to get out in the field with some of you in the future if you are interested in learning to ID some of our local manzanitas. If you see a stump sprouter, you can almost be assured that it's Eastwood or Arctostaphylus glandulosa. Uh, if it doesn't have a burl or isn't stump sprouting after a fire and coming back from seed, it's, well, it's a mixed bag. It could be one of several species. To the best of my knowledge, all Cianothus species in California are obligate cedars following fire. So they only recover from a seed bank. In some cases, uh, some species can be severely repressed um, 
through the growth of overstory trees like knobcone pine or Douglas fir and so forth so forth, but they do leave a seed bank even after plants die uh, due to uh, the competitive effects of uh, surrounding plants. And uh, I would say of all the ceanothus I saw, wavy leaf ceanothus was by far the most numerous and had seemed to have an astounding uh, rate of growth. Uh, by 20 months after the fire, some of these seedlings that were probably all of an inch or two tall a uh, year earlier were now up to four or five, six feet tall really rapid growth rate and uh, already becoming difficult to make your way through as of last, late last spring. A wonderful discovery on lots of the wavy leaf ceanothus were these larvae of what I believe I identified as variable checker flat butterfly. And uh, so the upper left and lower right photos are the larvae feeding actively. As far as I know, they're having lunch. Uh, wavy leaf ceanothus, uh, I'm not sure if they're eating uh, primarily leaves. I do see some nodes that look like they've been stripped of leaves, so that would be my assumption that they're not eating other tissues. Yeah, I do see some cut leaves, so I'm going to guess primarily on the ceanothus foliage. And then the uh, lower left and upper right is the adult version or a stage of that uh, butterfly. Uh, the upper left, lower right were taken at Glen Oaks in April and about six weeks later, lower left and upper right taken near the summit of Hood Mountain on uh, Globe Gilia, Gilia capitata, uh, some of which are in flower in the upper right, uh, mostly still in bud. And another Ceanothus, uh, Sonoma Ceanothus. Uh, this is a, I believe, California rare plant rank 1B.2. Uh, raises a question about the relative rarity, certainly, you know, a human construct in terms of determination of rare plants, although, you know, there is a factual observational basis to that determination. But there are other factors, extenuating circumstances that I think might play into the determinations of how rare a plant might be and how much of that might be influenced by uh, Lack of recent fire, fire repression, uh, competitive interactions that change over time. For instance, how many of the Sonoma Ceanothus were still extant prior to the fire that were not really visible or def definitely very difficult to access in terms of somebody going out doing a survey and looking for them? So um, one thing that I try to note when I'm compiling data on rare plants in the field to the California or for the California Natural Diversity Database as one of the potential impacts on the rare flora or on any of the native flora in California, I think something to always consider is has the historic fire regime potentially been altered over time? So I actually sometimes do list as a possible threat uh, the alterations to long-long-term uh, historical fire regimes uh, for those particular plants. The leaves tend to be really small, as shown in that lower photograph, and uh, none of these were flowering. I'm not sure at what point, but they may be starting to flower this spring. Okay, another plant. This one I'm also not sure. There may be some stump sprouting from chaparral nightshade. Uh, if, if you garden at all, you may recognize the resemblance of this plant to potatoes and eggplant and peppers and so forth, definitely in the same nightshade family as those uh, common garden vegetables. Uh, beautiful, beautiful flowers. Uh, I actually found wonderful stands at Secret Pasture as well as out in Franz Valley uh, and a few other locations that burned in 2017. It's mostly in chaparral, but also in an adjacent knobcone pine woodland and kind of a mixed oak type of scrub, kind of a transitional uh, vegetation type between uh, live oak or uh, other oak woodlands and pure chaparral. Okay, so this, as far as I know, is the obligate cedar, hands down, no argument from me certainly, uh, that this is one plant that absolutely depends on fire in order to recover populations following fire. And Napcone pine, Pinus attenuata, um, is actually an example of pyrescence. Well, what does that mean? Well, pyrescence is actually kind of a subset or a specific type of serotony, some of whom 
you recognize that word. Serotony in general is just this, um, some kind of an environmental trigger causes seed release, whether it might be wetting, it could be the death of plant, heat of the sun, drying out, um, damage to the plant, all sorts of different circumstances can generally apply to the term or to which the, those phenomenon or that plant would be called a serotonous plant um, or the seeds themselves serotonous. However, uh, pyrescence is the form of serotony under which uh, is specifically caused by fire. Even there, I, I couldn't find any information specifically what about fire causes that break from dormancy in those seeds. Is it merely the heat? Is it somehow breakdown of the seed coat or other chemical alter alterations in soil or smoke uh, that influences uh, seed germination? And if pyrescence is followed in short order by an, uh, an absolute essential wetting of seeds, I'm not clear about this for napcone pine. So napcone pine might be strictly pyrescent, or it could be pyrohydrescent as well. So I'm not really sure. And maybe we'll get some information to that if, well, I'm not really sure. We haven't necessarily had the driest spring on record uh, in the area of the Kincaid fire. I would expect there'll be some germination of knobcone pine in that area. But it would be interesting just to look at, although not a very scientific approach, but to look at relative number of knobcone pine seedlings in that burn zone compared to those in the uh, tubs or nuns fires. So here are some uh, knobcone pine snakes from the Kincaid fire area. Notice the opening of the cone scales. Uh, most notable in the lower left, but even those that are retained on the trees, if you look closely, uh, those cones have been opened up by the heat of fire and likely shed seeds from those cone scales. So what about this plant? Sure, looks like a pine. Does it smell like a pine? Does it walk like a pine? I don't know, what do you think? I know when I first saw this, I kind of did a double take and I was thinking, moderate pine? I hope not. Golden fleece, and no, not that kind. <laughs> this is a pl common plant name for a really common, uh, sorry about that, I'm not sure why that happened. Um, I believe this is another obligate cedar uh, following fire. Uh, boy, I hardly saw any of this until the more recent fires, and uh, it even really didn't show up right off the bat. I know Greg Denevers told me he looked pretty much in vain for this at Pepperwood, never found it. He did find a few on adjacent properties. The lower photograph I took, um, actually I think I took that one a few years ago. The larger seedling or the seedling I took a photograph of on the left is from near Pepperwood on, in Franz Valley. So uh, this is a recent shot from the bare, relatively bare ground in the Kincaid fire zone. First, call your attention to the all the oxidized iron exhibiting itself as the reddening of the rocks and gravel on the uh, soil surface. It's a common factor in intense fires, the oxidation of iron even within rocks and pebbles and so forth. But here are two of our native nitrogen fixers. Again, critical components of the early post-fire flora on the lower left. I'm not actually sure if that's a vetch. Could be, uh, if it's a vetch, most likely a non-native. It could also be an acmispan or native lotus. In the upper right, of course, is a lupin seedling. And again, both of these uh, plants as legumes. In addition to the legumes, by the way, uh, Ceanothus is a, I, I believe the entire genus is commonly associated with nitrogen fixing bacteria. So in both these groups of plants, they uh, actually form little compartments or nodules on the roots um, that sequester the bacteria, uh, provide uh, carbohydrate to the bacteria, which is the energy that drives the ability of those bacteria to actually whole you know, atmospheric nitrogen and to break those molecules down and uh, essentially uh, recombine that nitrogen with oxygen to form uh, nitrates, which are essential for plant growth. And that's the available form, uh, nitrate NO3 minus for many recovering plants. So legumes, critically important in ecosystems. I will put in a strong, uh, vote and cheer for our native legumes, how critically important they are uh, to California in post-fire landscapes. Uh, as again, nitrogen being the most uh, volatile or one of the more volatile macronutrients as well as uh, an essential component of plant growth, uh, 
it's quickly lost in most ecosystems or bound up in growing and living plant matter. So it quickly becomes a limiting factor for plant growth. And um, that which isn't lost, volatilized, uh, it's essential that there are these nitrogen fixing bacteria and they're called symbiont plants in recovering uh, burned ecosystems to replenish some of that atmospheric nitrogen for the eventual recovery of more plants on those, in those landscapes. More examples of nitrogen fixers, three species of acmispan. The uh, lower two, colchita and small flowered acmispan in the lower right. Those two plants were almost covered the ground over large areas, uh, especially in 2018, somewhat less so last year. Uh, the American birchfoot trefoil in the upper right. Later flowering, I didn't see as much of that, but in some areas was uh, relatively dense compared to pre-fire populations that I generally observe. And the last, but certainly not least, uh, not necessarily even last, but all the native clovers and some non-native ones in extant in Sonoma County, we have over 40 species of uh, clovers, non-native and natives in Sonoma County a stand of tomcat clover from Live Oaks Ranch. And I didn't name these very quickly. Uh, for those of you who are comfortable with Latin, if not, you can ask me later. On the upper left is a uh, Trifolium bifidum variety decipiens. Upper right is Trifolium depauperatum variety, the same depauperatum. Lower right is Trifolium variegatum. Uh, middle lower is Trifolium obtusiflorum, and lower left is Trifolium microcephalum. And all but the, the Trifolium obtusiflorum were quite common in grasslands and to some extent in chaparral and oak woodlands following recent fires. Obtusiflorum is a little bit more unusual, uh, occurs in moist places, typically in grassland on or off serpentine in Sonoma County. And one of my favorite native plant genera, which actually I rarely see any. Even this, the more common of the three, most common of the three, sailflowered snapdragon. This, these photographs were taken right next to Pepperwood along Trans Valley Road. Uh, this plant made a great recovery. I wound up later seeing it at both Glen Oaks Ranch and uh, Secret Pasture Properties. Uh, quite beautiful. You will probably see this hang on in some areas for a little while. Um, especially in the Kincaid Fire area, that was the first time I think I ever identified this plant uh, right along Pine Flat Road, uh, probably halfway or so up into the sanctuary uh, from the base of the road. Clarkia species, both of these fairly common, but both seem to proliferate in burned areas following the fire. Uh, for those of you who drove um, some of the back roads in eastern Sonoma County, especially I remember Mark West Springs Road that burned so intensely during the uh, Tufts fire, just amazing stands of Clarkia Consina uh, all through that area. And uh, they kind of weren't quite as prolific last year, but I, a lot of the stands will probably last for a while. Again, neither of these species is, uh, strictly speaking, a fire follower, but the populations were enhanced. Uh, by the fires, as well as pagodas or Chinese houses. I saw a lot of stands of these mixed with Red Ribbons, Clarkia, Clarkia Consina. These photos were taken on Franz Valley, but I did see this repeated in other parts of eastern Sonoma County uh, last spring, as well as uh, 2018. And this little plant that uh, I really saw very much of in eastern Sonoma County is probably a little more conspicuous and common in coastal Sonoma and Mendocino counties, very leaf colomia. Uh, in the phlox family, uh, small trumpet shaped flowers kind of, I believe they kind of fade from pink to white as they mature. Large, I mean, typically I see plants, they're a couple of inches tall, a couple of inches across. Some of these plants were two to three feet in diameter with hundreds of flowers in the inflorescences. So quite good displays, uh, relatively sporadic. I didn't see it all over the place, but where I did see populations, they were uh, really healthy in terms of numbers. Canyon Nemophila, places in oak woodland, uh, typically on shaded, fairly cool, damp slopes. Literally hundreds of thousands of flowers just bedecking that whole, sometimes acres and acres under typically uh, deciduous, uh, to some extent coast live oak uh, with these 
almost pure white flowers. A little bit of lilac in those. Smaller versions of baby blue eyes. Daughter. Prolific number um, amount of daughter that I found, especially in chaparral. This may be the species commonly called chaparral daughter, which I think is a subspecies of Cascuta californica, although I don't recall specifically. And uh, it wasn't flowering. I wasn't able to identify uh, which species of daughter. Uh, these photos were taken, I believe, at Glen Oaks Ranch. And daughter, typically, interestingly enough, assumes a life history, to some extent, of its host plant. So if it's hosting or parasitizing a, an annual plant, well, what happens when the annual plant dies? I presume, unless it moves to a secondary host, that the daughter plant also dies. Whereas, apparently, it will persist on perennial plants. And in this photograph alone, there are, I see it looks like it's parasitizing in the upper right, the Colchita, Acmaspan, Brachycarpus. It's also clearly parasitizing uh, wavy leaf Ceanothus, a woody perennial. Looks like bay, another woody perennial. And I think I saw somewhere a little bit of parasitism going on with the uh, morning glory. So <laughs> who knows? Multiple hosts at one time? Don't know. Interesting study for someone, I suppose, and how, how might that shift over time? Okay, uh, darn yellow composites. Uh, very common, Mattia gracilis, but in some places just beautiful displays of monster plants, much, much bigger than I generally see. Some of the plants I saw four or five, six feet tall, uh, some with hundreds of flower heads uh, per plant, and a little more of a uh, I would say in terms of its flowering stage, phenology, inconspicuous, uh, but quite common chaparral plant in Sonoma County. Silver puffs, these are generally more noticeable when they're actually in fruit, looking like kind of a, a dandelion heads, um, but much larger. Often confused with the flowering heads of Acherichina mollis or blowwives. And because grasses aren't gonna get a lot of uh, attention tonight, this is uh, one of our, my more favorite, most favorite native grasses, the perennial Melica toriana. The flower heads you can see there with the uh, silver puff flowers. And a Diogenes lantern. A couple of a little, uh, maybe a little less noticeable or offbeat of our sunflower family. These both in the chicory tribe. Uh, lettuce, for instance, is also in the chicory tribe. Things like south thistle. Um, dandelions. Um, for those of you familiar with sunflower plant morphology, I'll just point out that a characteristic of this tribe or this group in the sunflower family is that they only have uh, ray flowers, which are typically the outer flowers in maybe a more commonly observed sunflower head that has two types of flowers, but in this group only ray flowers. And it really, that in addition to often having milky sap in most of the species, those two characters alone can pretty much really narrow down because otherwise <laughs> recognizing the tribes in the sunflower family, I just leave it at that, is a lot easier if you can get immediately to shrink down the key in the Jepson manual or otherwise. So the Raffineschia, I saw, I typically just see a plant here, one there, one there. I believe I photographed a plant on the left. I believe that's from Sugarloaf Ridge. Uh, Stephanomeria, somewhat more common. I know I, I, I know I took that photo on Franz Valley School Road. And blooms quite late. The chicory is more of a spring, late spring bloomer, but the uh, Stephanomeria typically blooms in late spring. And they typically aren't real showy until they're actually in flower. And even then, they because the Raffineschi is not common um, or abundant, you easily lose it against the rest of the vegetation. Uh, and the annual stone crop, so unlike a lot of the other stone crops, or the one that we're most familiar with uh, on coastal rocks and north-facing cliffs and rocks in Sonoma County, uh, sedum, uh, uh, now I'm forgetting, uh, spathio, spathiolifolium is our most common perennial sedum. This is an annual stone crop. I don't see it all that often, but occasionally if I look hard enough, I will find it on uh, north-facing rocky slopes, uh, vernally wet mossy slopes, I would say, mossy, or in this case, in the left, that is not a true moss, but that is a vascular plant. 
in the uh, Selaginella or spike moss genus. The flowers themselves are somewhat reminiscent of some of the uh, St. John's wort flowers, which you might see later on. And uh, you know, with this slide, I'm going to take a, a really short break of about two minutes. Uh, you're welcome to do the same. Uh, what I have to say about Tonella is it's a beautifully illiterate alliterative, not illiterate, alliterative name, uh, Latin binomial for a delicate and graceful plant. And I think it has a matching common name, perfectly suited to this beauty. So with that, I will return within a couple of minutes. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. Uh, we will continue um, with the rest of the presentation and then a question and answer session uh, afterward. Um, I did just send everyone a link to a post uh, event survey. Um, in the, you should, should see that in your chat box. Um, so if you could please copy that link and then go to the survey after the presentation, we would really love your feedback. Again, Neil is collecting questions if you want to send him any questions in the chat. Hello, everyone. You'll also have the opportunity to quote, raise your hand. If you go to the bottom of your screen, there's a uh, button called participants and you click on that and you should have an option in the window that pops up that says raise your hand. So once we start the Q&A section, uh, you'll have the opportunity to raise your hand and I'll go through in a somewhat random order. I'll try to Keep an eye on uh, when people raise their hand. Um, and we have a few writing questions already. So stay tuned and we'll get to all of them. All righty, I'm back. And without further ado, keep this moving along since I see we're running short on time. We are more or less heading into the home stretch. Um, quickly running through some of the annual pulse fire endemics. These are plants that for the most part um, make a brief appearance following fires for a year or two and typically pretty much disappear from the landscape over time. Probably the most notable one last couple of years, the one that was certainly most popularized in the media, Whispering Bells, uh, and probably rightfully so. Uh, I think it's easily recognizable by the the foliage and uh, uh, there were some nice displays uh, at a, a secret pasture property in particular but the very most notable largest displays I think I've ever seen were at Sugarloaf Ridge State Park and that's pretty much what it looked like in uh, May I believe May probably late April actually of 2018 on the uh, lower Bald Mountain Trail at Sugarloaf Ridge. <laughs> Kind of the converse in terms of its visibility and probably notoriety or popularity, better word, is uh, Divericate allophyllum or pink false gilia. Uh, this is a fairly low growing herbaceous plant that I'd kind of been looking for for early 2018 in the spring, kind of kept expecting to find it, actually made a mistake, mistaken identification of another plant, initially thinking it might have been allophyllum, it turned out it wasn't, and continued to look for it, eventually found it towards the end of spring of 2018, I think in the, uh, the first week of June, a relatively small population, or at least limited spatially to maybe, oh, probably a quarter of an acre or so at um, Secret Pasture. And as it turns out, this is the, uh, this was the first and I believe only documented population in Sonoma County. So, mm -hmm. Kind of noteworthy in that regard, it was growing kind of a mixed stand of knobcone pine and Douglas fir with some chaparral elements um, on that property. One of the treasures of the spring, again, I noted earlier how much I love snapdragons, and uh, you know, a lot of the native ones are probably a little less gaudy than the uh, domesticated, uh, cultivated ones in the horticultural trade. This was a magical plant. I think the first flower I saw literally looked like it was suspended in the air and I saw it and I recognized it right away as a, uh, 
you know, formerly a fig wart, kind of a snapdragon or penstemon type flower. And, and then I, you know, kind of came to my senses and cause I, I knew about Kellogg's snapdragon, but I hadn't seen it. And sure enough, and it was just, you know, one of those moments of ecstasy that I actually occurred for me frequently uh, the last two springs. Just, just a, I don't know, very charming plant to me. Uh, in the upper right are the mature fruits that I photographed, uh, I believe in June of 2018. And uh, it turned out that I found relatively few plants, uh, Glen Oaks as well as secret pasture property in 2018, a few in each location. Last year at Glen Oaks, in one day, hundreds and hundreds of plants. And it was a much broader area than I had seen in 2018. So it may actually outperform itself in the second year following fire as opposed to the first. But that could be, and it's probably a very variable characteristic of populations. Brewer calendrinia, another uh, fairly well-renowned uh, post-fire endemic, typically appears the first couple of years at the fire and pretty much disappears from landscapes. I had seen this before, um, Cow Mountain in uh, Mendocino County about 10 years ago. Pretty much recognized it immediately. It has quite a bit of resemblance to its close relative, uh, common red mates, uh, which I show you in the, the flower of in lower right, which is blooming now, certainly out here in my neighborhood in Western Sonoma County, along roadsides and in apple orchards and some vineyards. Um, the distinctions are primarily in the relative dimensions of the fruit compared to the calyx, which I'm trying to show you in the upper right. Uh, there are also fruits visible in the upper left, but those aren't quite mature. Uh, in any event, Brewer calendrini, the individual flowers are somewhat smaller. The flowers are paler pink. The plants themselves tend to be enormous compared to red maids. Some of those plants in the lower left, not necessarily those particular plants, but Brewer calendrini, I literally saw plants that were probably four or five feet in diameter sprawling across the soil, intertwined with one another as well as with other species. Uh, Last year, the plants were probably a little more, uh, I would say, demure than they were the year before, uh, restrained, although I saw them over a much wider distribution, that much broader than what I had seen in 2018. So that was an interesting observation. And I actually expect that there may be a few left this, this spring, but I wouldn't count on seeing very much. But I'd be interested if anybody does see any, if we are ever able to get out into the wild. Uh, this particular Silene, I won't tell you the whole backstory on this. I initially identified it in the Jeff's Emanuel Silene coniflora, which was technically correct, except that um, a uh, colleague of mine this past spring posted a photo he took from the same population at Glen Oaks, posted it on iNaturalist, and I believe it's Matt Gilliams, the curator at Santa Barbara Botanical Garden corrected the identification to Silene multinervia, which I've re are actually chosen here because Matt, in a um, paper that he cited, that I can't remember the names of the authors right off the top of my head, that provided very good uh, both molecular as well as morphological evidence that um, multi Silene multinervia, Silene coniflora are not the same plant. They are not synonyms for the same plant. That multinervia, is the Silene that pretty much fills the niche as a fire following annual plant in much of California's chaparral communities. Uh, Coniflora is even listed in Jepson Manual as a non-native plant, which did cause me to scratch my head. My gosh, there's so much of a non-native plant returning as a post-fire plant. Well, um, something I overlooked or didn't, I just chose not to include because it was just too much more information for tonight. Um, there are actually quite a few non-native plants that proliferated following recent fires. Uh, another management concern. A couple of uh, diminutive members of the bellflower or uh, family, the Campanulaceae, on the left, a uh, few flowered heterocodon, and on the right, narrow flowered Campanula or bellflower or harebell, actually. Narrow flowered harebell and Campanula grows in relatively gravelly, dry habitats, whereas the heterocodona is more or less a denizen of uh, kind of vernally wet, moist habitats. 
the small flowered hunt, sun cup. I looked for this a lot in the early stages of 2018. Finally found it in fruit on Franz Valley School Road in June of uh, 2018. And last year saw it in flower near the summit of Hood Mountain. So it was kind of a, uh, I guess a vindication for the time I spent actively looking for it the year before. But quite a few of them left at Hood Mountain. I don't know again how long this will persist um, near the summit, but it was there last year and in fair numbers. Another Clarkia. Uh, this is a plant species that's common in uh, middle elevations of the Sierra Nevada. I don't believe I'd ever seen it. It has been documented from Sonoma County before, most likely following fires. So it may be essentially uh, the Sonoma County ecotype may be a fire follower, whereas the Sierra species is not necessarily so. Uh, the plants I saw of the rhomboid Clark ear were uh, again right at the summit of Hood Mountain and also at uh, Glen Oaks Ranch in Chaparral. California mustard, oh, sporadically common, kind of small bunched populations in a few places, uh, Live Oaks Ranch and Secret Pasture in particular, uh, where this photograph was taken. Uh, small white mustard flowers, blooms fairly early and with uh, really noticeable when it's in fruit, as in the left-hand photo with the long siliques hanging, drooping from the stems. Characteristic, fairly characteristic foliage in the lower right. A relative of snapdragons, uh, Texas toad flax, another plant that's interesting, uh, the plants on the, the plant on the left and the upper right photographs taken at Glen Oaks Ranch, um, seems to be a fire follower in Chaparral and in interior Sonoma County, as it's not, I believe, been really uh, documented very well in interior Sonoma County. However, I know this plant from working in its midst during my master's thesis work on Bodega Head uh, back in the 1990s. And I wound up taking a whole bunch more photos of it this past, uh, last spring, or last, I believe it was actually into the summer at the Goat Rock uh, Dune system. And if you look carefully, I, or maybe not even so carefully, you can probably see uh, some pretty evident morphological distinctions between the flowers of these two populations, uh, the interior one above and the coastal one below. One of uh, the prizes, another plant that I really, really wanted to find and really didn't have to look too hard for this one. Uh, initially saw it along Cavedale Road, subsequently at Sugarloaf Ridge, Hood Mountain, and uh, then I managed to find a lot of it, and it actually persisted quite well at uh, Glen Oaks Ranch into the uh, last spring, as well as uh, being uh, observed in 2018. And uh, I'll just let the pictures do the talking for this plant, because I think it's just one of the sweetest plants. I am not responsible for the photo on the lower left, and I regret that I don't remember who actually took that photo, but I didn't witness anything quite like that, but Upper Cave Dale Road had some places that were pretty close to that. And then this marvelous creature that uh, my friend that accompanied me that day and I found, I don't recall, I believe it was on the, a grass stem. And uh, I struggled with identifying this initially, I, not an entomologist, and uh, kind of tried to essentially picture book it online with photographs. And I continued to look for butterfly lardy and just no success. And they said, well, what about a moth? Bingo. <laughs> I think it took all of another 30 seconds to pretty much say, yeah, that's got to be it. And I wound up posting this photo on iNaturalist. And I believe I've gotten some confirmations or agreements with my provisional <laughs> identification. And I don't know much about it, but I know that sphinx moths are one of the very you know, large, almost hummingbird-like uh, moths. And I rarely see them around here, but apparently they're extant as adults. Okay, uh, I believe this is pretty much the last group, and I'm going to really rip through these. So many strategies for this group of plant in terms of regeneration following fire. Subterranean parts like bulbs, codices, corms, rhizomes, sap roots, tubers. Some regenerate from seed, and a few, a group of them, are root parasites, meaning 
actually they're hemiparasites for the most part, and there will be a few of those included in the coming pictures. And of course, one of those that appeared in prolif uh, proliferation, common in any event, in any year, in many places, soap root, but really made a great showing following um, fires in 2018, or the showing in 2018. Uh, one of the more colorful ones, Danny Skullcap, uh, a relatively non-fragrant mint. Uh, the photograph in the upper right, I credit Neil Kramer for, but it actually shows the reason why it bears that specific epithet of tuberosa. You can see the swelling areas along the very lower stem, which is actually buried in the soil, a, a rhizomatous tuber growing at the base of the plants from which the, the roots actually emerge from off the um, exterior of those uh, tubers. Beautiful plant, already starting to seems like a uh, decline in terms of population numbers in Chaparral as of last year compared to 2018. Two color morphs of the common woolly paintbrush. Uh, I definitely did not take the upper left hand photo, but I think I threw it in there because I had a photo of yellow flowering. And actually there, it's mostly the bracts. It's not, so these are bracts are leaf like structures that actually are beneath the actual flowers. In the lower left-hand photo, you might see a couple of flowers kind of peeking out from bracts um, on those flower heads. Uh, but most of the color in most of the paint brushes is exhibited by the bracts themselves. A little bit of color in the calices, but very little in other than yellow or yellow-green in the actual flower or corolla part of the flower. More paintbrush. Pretty common in coloring up chaparral or in the lower left, kind of in a mixed oak woodland scrub type of area, growing with other more typical woodland forbs like iris uh, macrosiphon. So this plant, um, I just, I was driving up Cape Dale Road probably oh, last March, maybe end of February or March. This was essentially the plant that was formative in my becoming a botanist. In uh, February of 1983, this plant was covering the, actually 1982, it was covering the ground in a place that I had just moved into. And I eventually wound up kind of picture book IDing. I went out and got a, a book, identified the plant, and uh, have been enamored of it ever since. It's always one of, been one of my favorites. And indeed, I now consider it to be my godmother plant as a botanist. It was the plant that essentially took me down the path um, from which I've never looked back with any regret. Great close-ups. I mean, it just it was even more stunning in person. And uh, hopefully you all have a chance to get out there this spring or probably more likely next spring at this point and take in actually quite abundant in various places throughout Eastern Sonoma County, a little bit less so coastally. Rayless arnica, I you know, talked briefly. So here we had some earlier in the, you remember the uh, Stephanomeria and Raffineschia, the plants in the chicory tribe, all ray flowers. Well, here's a plant with all disc flowers in the sunflower family. So it doesn't have any of those broad petal-like flowers at the um, perimeter of the flower heads, all just a small star-shaped disc flowers in the middle. Hence the name Rayless arnica. Arnica is a favorite genus of mine, mostly for the fragrance of its foliage and certainly for, um, for um, homeopathic remedies. Arnica is well known for its uh, he um, healing properties. And I, in the upper left-hand photo, you maybe can't see off in the distance there, but that area was just absolutely covered with Rayless Arnica. I certainly saw more of it in the last two years than I'd seen in all my prior history of botanizing. Um, all together and just relatively a few visits to, uh, in this case, uh, Secret Pasture. It was also fairly common along Cape Dale Road and somewhat at Glen Oaks. Morning lures everywhere. Just unbelievable numbers. Probably a little more restrained last year than early in 2018. Uh, my only question is, and uh, I was actually provided photographs of what I was initially convinced, absolutely, and it may very well have been, germinating seedlings of Pacific morning glory. Um, however, it's a perennial plant. 
and it does have rhizomes and I'm just not convinced from the very rapid and just stupendous proliferation of morning glory that all of that could have been germinated from seed. I, it may be as a bet, bet hedger again, reproducing from seed as well as from uh, buried rhizomes. I don't know. It's uh, something to explore in the future. The coyote mints, uh, mints uh, or Monardella genus. Uh, this, uh, Monardella viridis uh, really responded extremely well. It's similar, I would say, to a few other plants that we saw earlier in that it seems to flower prolifically after fire, but not much thereafter or at other times. I'd actually been looking for this in flower for years. I think once before did I see it actually in flower, anything close, and it may have been an area that it burned um, because I wasn't familiar with the fire history in that area which I saw about 15 years ago. And on the upper right, probably a little more common, especially coastally, is the hairy parody mint. Um, green monardella is a rank four, California rare plant rank four. Um, bee plant, a plant I always associated with moist, damp, kind of not necessarily riparian, but moist and cool habitats. And uh, here it was growing out in the middle of Chaparral as a dominant and very robust plant uh, much to my surprise, I know Greg Denevers also remarked how surprised he was to see the numbers and the size of the individual plants in Chaparral and oak, uh, oak woodlands to some extent, but mostly in Chaparral. Quite a surprise. These photographs are from uh, Hood Mountain. California bed straw. Two different shades of chartreuse, green chartreuse and yellow. And yes, they are both actually acknowledged colors in the paint trade, I believe. But in any case, the foliage as well as the flowers just always caught my eye and I've you know, got some relatively good photos of this plant. Quite common, often overlooked. California bed straw, another legume, California tea. I don't know about the tea part, but the flowers actually are quite beautiful. And I just saw a lot more of this in a lot more places than I had any idea was out there. And then suddenly, how did I wake up in a Dr. Seuss book? I don't know how else to describe some of my initial reactions to seeing these stands of this plant, but just kind of overwhelmed with awe and amazement and joy. It was just absolutely stunning. And really you do have to be there, but I'm just so grateful that I was and was able to get a few photographs of this because just absolutely stunning. This is a photograph from Secret Pasture Another in the same area, uh, zero film 10x, bear grass, a critically important plant to indigenous cultures for cordage and basket tree materials. Um, probably held a great deal of spiritual significant significance as well, given its importance to their utilitarian uses. And uh, really quite common in California. I've seen a lot of it before, but I just never seen anything quite like this before. Uh, and it may persist. There may be a little bit, you know, maybe not quite in the numbers you see here, but I'm hoping that maybe for a year or two there will still be some displays or at least flowering plants. I really don't know. Uh, wand or twig-like snapdragon, another rank four rare plant in California. Uh, I, another plant I had looked for most of the spring of 2018, didn't find it until the last day I was out in the field. Turned out it was a very hot day. I was on private land up near the uh, Napa, Sonoma County boundary and found these, the plants on the left. Subsequently, last year, I actually found large numbers of this at Glen Oaks and a few smaller populations at Secret Pasture. So um, I was able to add it to the flora of each of those two properties. Quite pretty, it's an interesting character that the flowers start to kind of oxidize at the tip so they get kind of a rusty mouth in short order. So I try to include some relatively intact and uh, I guess less uh, oxidized flowers here. California sunflower, uh, completely just amazing displays. Uh, probably the first plant that I was awestruck by uh, going out early in April of 2018 uh, at various locations. 
both the floral morphology and to some extent the leaf morphology and the overall stature of plants really varies quite a bit from one population to another. If you look at the flowers in the upper right and the ray flowers, dimensions and overall shape compared to that in the lower left, quite different. The Sealy as well. Why do I look puzzled? I initially tried to identify this as a couple of other species. I, I wound up settling on the Sealy imbricata after consultation and input from other botanists online. And um, what threw me was the very different morphology in these reemergent plants or even seedlings uh, compared to mature plants that I typically see in these tussocks of rosettes that. Um, closely resemble what's in the lower right, or although often in really dense colonies of multiple rosettes. I just wasn't used to seeing these uh, seven, six, seven foot tall spires of bristly flower heads like this. Typically those flowers, peduncles are much shorter, uh, closer to the ground. That threw me off, as well as this one, which I have always associated with coastal environments. Yeah, this one actually, I thought I, you know, I think I ID'd it correctly. It was uh, fairly easy to run through the key, and uh, there were some characters that fit it very well, and I just, as far as I know, it's California Phacelia, which is quite common at the coast. This stand was taken in uh, being enveloped now by wavy leaf Ceanothus at Secret Pasture property, and there was one magnificent stand kind of down, down in a hollow on that property. It's the only place I saw it last year in any of the post-fire areas. So facilities of which there are well over 100 taxa or species and subspecies in California, uh, it can be a little bit of a vexing genus. The perennials in particular, even though it's a relatively small group, some of the characters are based on numbers of seeds. If you don't have mature fruit, you can't do that. And then the other characters are typically leaf characters and they seem to overlap so much, it really gets to be almost pointless to try to bother with it at that point. Um, Another California rank for rare plant, Napa lomatium. Uh, I see a fair amount of this at Glen Oaks in particular. It's fairly common in the Myocomus range. I've seen it in a number of places. And uh, the plants in the upper left are actually, looks like they're gone past peak maturity for flowers and uh, pretty much developing fruit. Uh, this kind of characteristic gray-green foliage is quite different from many of the other native lomatiums. It does seem to be pretty much restricted to the uh, volcanic soils and substrates in the Myocomus range in uh, Northern California. Okay, I could give you a long story. I'm just gonna leave it at this. This was a, a just a, a wonderful surprise that happened uh, kind of very incidentally uh, along the roadside on Cave Dale Road. When I saw this plant, I knew what genus it was in, and I immediately said, gosh, I know all the common ones, and realized in my head that most of the other taxa in this genus, Cydalsia, in Northern California at least, are rare plants. I got very excited, went home, ID'd it, checked with a couple of people that were more authoritative in terms of identification, sent them some of my early photos, pretty much got the identification corroborated almost immediately. And then the genus author for the Jepson Manual um, in Illinois strongly recommended um, I make some collections and try to submit to several different herbaria in California, which I did. And this is only the second known population, the other being in Napa County. And it turns out that the population um, in uh, the Myocomus range in, um, Sonoma County extends well over into Napa County. That was determined last year during a California Native Plant Society rare plant survey for the species in that area of Cape Dale Road. But it does grow on the secret pasture property and then from there upslope all the way over into Napa County. Some of the stands kind of more or less on the route into the secret pasture property, but just extending for acres and acres. Um, it's, it's amazing to me that following the fire, um, fires in 19, the early uh, mid-60s uh, in this area, or subsequent fires, that apparently this plant had never been seen before, and it literally grows right along Cape Dale Road uh, for, a sh for a stretch. So kind of amazing to me, but it was certainly probably the best surprise I had all spring long. A little bit of variability in the color. Last year's flowers did seem to be conspicuously a little bit less 
pink than the prior year. But they were still extant and growing. It is a perennial plant. Uh, I don't really know what its life history is. I don't know if uh, most of those plants are just going to gradually dissipate. Will it maybe be an all-at-once event? And will they even show up at all until after the next fire? Even this year, I don't know. I hope to, at some point, try to get up there before they're completely potentially gone this year. Star lily, uh, along with the uh, little California sunflower, uh, one of the early and most uh, noticeable uh, post-fire plants in uh, Chaparral in Eastern Sonoma County. And ethereal spear, uh, not a necessarily a fire follower by any means, typically very common uh, relative of lilies throughout um, the burned area. So it was uh, doing very well the last couple of years in terms of numbers. This is another rank four uh, related to the ethereal spear, dark mouth trillea. Um, a couple of plants that I found photographed there on the left at Glen Oaks in 2013. And on the lower right, all those yellow splotches. And this is just a very small part of that population, uh, just a short distance from where I took that photograph in 2013. Uh, the photographs I took in 2019 of an individual flower head, and then part of that population there. So just an amazing recovery or regeneration event following fire. And uh, two different species of Brodea. Uh, you might see the difference. I'll just point it out very quickly. Those white structures in the center of the flowers known as staminodes, stamen-like appendages, or in non-fertile stamens, are uh, held way back from the actual functional stamens in the common harvest brodea, whereas in the rank 1b.2 rare plant, brodea leptandra, which uh, proliferated just thousands and thousands and thousands of plants at Glen Oaks and Secret Pasture and other locations in eastern Sonoma County. The uh, staminodes are held almost surrounding the uh, stamens and anthers in the narrow flowered brodea. Fairly easy to tell apart once you kind of develop that search image. And they were sympatric or growing together, uh, generally two closely related species that grow together, uh, but are distinct taxa. Um, and these were both, they were sympatric at uh, secret pasture. There's part of the population I photographed. I actually think this is from Fans, Fans Valley Road, but very similar to what we saw at both Glen Oaks and secret pasture. A couple of common calicordus species um, that recovered really well and quite numerous in various places, especially for the Diogenes Lantern 2018 was a banner year. And uh, I mostly wanted to show you some of the diversity in floral morphology and coloration in uh, the Golden Nuggets Mariposa. One of the first lilies I identified way back in the early 1980s along Cave Dale Road came back like crazy. Uh, the last couple of years have been really numerous and got lots of photographs the last two years along Cave Dale and other locations on volcanic soils. Um, it pretty much persists in most areas and blooms to some extent in most of those populations uh, without fire, but certainly the last couple of years been quite prolific in some of the burned areas. Oh, absolutely gorgeous plant. Okay, the first sign I saw of the last and but certainly not least uh, with these plants growing right along a road bank on Cave Dale Road, and I hadn't seen these plants before. I had seen this type of evidence in past years in other places like Annadel, going back into the 1990s. Um, but I said, well, this is one place I can return to within a few weeks to really have a treat. And here it was probably all of two weeks later at Glen Oaks, and I actually spliced three photographs here because I didn't seem to have one that really captured. This is pretty much what I looked at from a distance initially. And I just remembered my jaw dropping and going, what is that? And put my, um, I think I actually had my camera in my hand, put my macro on and I realized they were red will or chaparral lilies and immediately was like bustling over there. And it turned out by the end of that day, um, my friend and I had seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these plants over many acres at Glen Oaks Ranch, mostly on east and north facing slopes, uh, kind of down towards the creek that more or less borders the north edge of the property, so pretty thick brush. I just had no idea 
had never seen any evidence of these on the property uh, in prior years, either during field trips or when I did the vegetation mapping. So I, I don't know what to say. I wish you all could see these and I hope you all do get to see them. And again, they are typically fire following uh, benefit beneficiaries, um, but you probably can find them somewhere and I will definitely share any locations I see them in the future with any of you who ask. And I leave you with a closing thought from Mary Oliver. Certainly true for me, and uh, I'm still practicing the depth of my seeing. Morning cloak butterfly, I believe. Please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm blue dips. I'm pretty certain of that. I'll give you a little bit of time to digest this. Uh, I don't know whether to call it tongue in cheek or sardonic. Uh, this is an interesting observation from someone who knows. <laughs> and um, I'll give you a little bit of time with that. I just, I thank you all so very much. For those of you who have hung in there, I know we're running a little bit late. And uh, the next panel will give you contact information for me if you either didn't stick around or if you have stuck around and you want to pose questions later on, definitely send me an email, anything you want about this presentation or plants in general. I'll do my best. Thank you again. I'm honored and privileged to have spent the evening with you.